welcome to session two. How are you? Did there seem to be more distractions this week? Did your devotion go well? What mountainous problems seem to be looming over your life right now? In the spring of 2017, our church faced an enormous mountain. We had gone all in on our pastor's God-given vision to move out of Segment High School and into our own facility. Each member of our leadership team had prayed and fasted along with much of the church and confirmed Pastor Ed's vision. We had moved forward in faith to purchase a building, but still faced the uncertainty of dwindling attendance and giving. When the loan commitment we had secured fell through, anxiety, fear, and despair seemed like all that was real. Despite the apparent lack of focus, Pastor Ed followed in faith his God-given vision. Following his lead, we also persevered in faith until the day when Pastor Ed received a phone call that changed everything. God had made a way for us to buy and renovate the building, and we've seen our church grow dramatically as Jesus has restored families and changed lives. Each of us have faced situations like this, hard times in which everything seems stacked against us. We know we should follow God. Simple. Simple however, does not mean easy. In times like this, Satan uses our emotions as a point of attack, attempting to pull us off course. How do we redirect the rudder of our emotions so that we stay on course? It begins with carefully monitoring our attitude. Attitude is different from emotions. Emotions are caused by how we view events around us. Attitude is the lens we use to view the world around us. It is a settled way of thinking or feeling that is reflected in our behavior. A driver cuts you off in traffic. My initial reaction is anger nine times out of 10. More like 99 times out of 100. I'm in a hurry. You could have caused an accident. Get off your phone. My attitude is one of selfishness. That one time out of 100, my initial reaction is concern. Why are they in such a hurry? Is everything okay? In Philippians 1, verses 12 through 30, Paul gives us many examples of how our attitude can affect how we respond to our circumstances. He begins the section with these words. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So what had happened? Paul had been thrown in jail. Paul responded by remaining focused on the gospel. How would you respond? Before you answer let's take a minute to talk about one of our other gaps, the historical gap. As we investigate the historical gap, we begin to learn what is happening in the setting of the text, which helps us understand what we read at a deeper level. The historical gap is the plot, knowing and understanding the events that occurred at the time of writing. If I were to tell you we found a love letter from a young soldier to his fiance. You would not be surprised to find declarations of his undying love and his desire to marry her. The letter would become even more poignant if it was dated December 8, 1941, and was sent from Hawaii. The declarations of love become even more poignant when you realize he survived the surprise attack that killed hundreds. The depth of his love grows in our understanding when we see his response to this tragedy is to share his story with his beloved. History gives us important clues that help us understand the text in Philippians. We know that Paul was a prisoner, but where was he imprisoned? Paul referenced the imperial guard in chapter 1 through 13, and Caesar's household in 422. Also, Paul seems to be unsure whether he would live or die, which suggests that someone would soon make that decision, and possibly that he was at the end of his life. Since we know that Caesar's household was in Rome and that Paul was later martyred in Rome, it seems likely that he wrote to the Philippians from that city. This means Paul was in a tight spot. He was imprisoned directly in the middle of the imperial machine, awaiting the trial that would decide his life. If that wasn't enough, the man who would decide his fate was none other than Nero, the insane, fiddled while Rome burned leader who persecuted Christians and sent them to horrible deaths. That is much worse than getting cut off in traffic. Paul stared death in the face, yet stayed centered on the gospel. He made that remarkable evaluation in verses 12 through 18 that it had served to advance the gospel. 
Paul conducted himself so that his captors knew the gospel and other believers were emboldened to share it as well. In addition, he acknowledged that others were deliberately preaching Christ in a manner that made things worse for him. And he rejoiced about it. He rejoiced that more people were hearing the gospel. How would you respond? What is joy? So often we use words, but the meaning of them is fuzzy to us. We use synonyms to describe it. Joy is happy. Joy is carefree. Joy is pleasure. Each of these words have a slightly different meaning. And if we group them all together, joy loses its power. Happy is a feeling of, of gladness and contentment based upon your circumstances. You are happy when you receive a gift. You are happy when a child does well. It is not something you control. Joy is the experience of gladness and contentment. Do you see the difference? Happiness is based on circumstances. Joy is a state of being. You can't experience joy without the circumstances that cause happiness. It is all about your attitude, how you choose to view your circumstances. You absolutely have control over whether you experience joy. Even as I say this, it sounds confusing. Happiness and joy are so closely related, confusion is normal. Most of the time, we let happiness determine if we experience joy. And that means we are driven by circumstance. And that is where the enemy pushes us to be. Instead, we should experience joy as one of the fruits of walking with Jesus. When we keep our attitude in check and use it to control our emotions, we are able to live more wholeheartedly before God, which produces the joyful experience of gladness and contentment in our lives. We can see it in chapter 1, 18 through 20, that Paul's ability to control his attitude and emotions was grounded in a deep trust in God's ability and willingness to work things according to his purposes. Because of that, he faced the possibility that his life could end with the eager expectation and hope that Jesus would be exalted through him, regardless of whether he lived or died. The principle that guided Paul's own life and that he passed on to the Philippians in verse 27 was to live a life worthy of the gospel. This was the source of his attitude and the lens through which Paul viewed everything. Because of that, he was willing to suffer in prison, hear his name dragged through the mud, and face death while experiencing joy and happiness. He was also willing to continue to serve faithfully if he was released. How would you respond? What are you willing to suffer for the sake of the gospel? If we're honest with ourselves, what we typically want is ease without hardship, success without sacrifice, maturity without growth. But God's kingdom doesn't work that way, and neither does our life. Our God is a God of process who uses our circumstances to grow us. Paul did not allow his circumstances to steal his joy or his happiness. Because of his gospel-centered attitude, Paul was able to rejoice. Do you want emotional health? Do you want to be able to respond that way? To be able to live a life that is not ruled by what you feel? to learn how to change what you feel. It begins with prioritizing what God prioritizes. After all, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Look for opportunities to advance God's agenda. When you're treated unfairly at work, what will make a case for the gospel? Demanding justice or demonstrating grace? When you have extra money, what will advance the gospel? Your second vacation of the summer or a commitment to fund someone's trip to India? We face decisions like this on a daily basis. I fail almost every time I get in the car. It is in the moment that you are emotionally upset that the battle rages. Do you sit in your circumstances and let them determine your emotions? The best thing to do at this moment is to pray. When that guy cuts you off, remember a passage like Psalm 101. I will sing of steadfast love and justice. To you, O Lord, I will make music. I will ponder the way that is blameless. Yeah, um, in that moment, 
I am not blameless. I'm angry and judging. Whoever slanders his neighbor secretly, I will destroy. Whoever has a haughty look and an arrogant heart, I will not endure. That is definitely me. No one hears what I say in my car. Sometimes my kids. I will look for favor on the faithful in the land, that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless shall minister to me. That is who I want to be. By focusing on God's word, I am able to shift my attitude. I still feel upset, but I begin praying for the person who cut me off. I much prefer my children to hear my prayers than my anger. This slowly and over time allows me to change how I view circumstances. So my one time out of 100 grows towards 10 out of 100, then 20, then 50. I have failed at this so many times. If you have failed at this so many times, welcome to the club. Don't be discouraged. Satan will try to use this to make you feel shame. Remember, it's not about your past failures, but your next step of obedience. The hardest part of changing our attitude is when we can practice. The only time you can work on exchanging your bad attitude for a good attitude is when you have a bad attitude. And we are normally emotionally upset too. This is why daily study of God's word and prayer is so important. It allows us to train our minds so when the moment comes, we can take every thought captive and submit it to Christ. We plant good seeds so we produce fruits of righteousness no matter the circumstances. When we seek Jesus first, he takes care of us. And that gives us the confidence to rely on him as Paul did with full courage. When our confidence is in him, it lifts our attitude. It lifts our emotions. We produce good fruit. How will you respond? Will you be ready?